Dear ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Zinovia Toludi, and I'm assistant professor of architecture at Studio Art. And today I have the pleasure of introducing Natalie, Natalie Jeremijenko, an artist, engineer, designer, and associate professor of art and art education at NYU, whose background includes studies in biochemistry, physics, neuroscience, precision engineering, history, and philosophy of science. In 2014, VIDA, Art and Artificial Life International Awards Pioneer Prize was awarded to Natalie Jeremijenko for her consistently brilliant portfolio of work over the past two decades, a prize only awarded once before to Laurie Anderson. Few more awards. Natalie Jeremijenko was awarded the 2013 Most Innovative People, was named of the Most Influential Woman in Technology 2011, was one of the inaugural top young innovators by MIT Technology Review, and was named one of the 40 most influential designers. At NYU, Jeremy Jenko directs the Environmental Health Clinic. You'll see a little bit of that here at Dartmouth. In the Visual Art Department, but she's also affiliated with the Computer Science Department Envir and Environmental Studies Program. Previously, she was one of the Visual Arts faculty at UCSD, Faculty of Engineering at Yale University, a visiting professor at Royal College of Art in London, a distinguished visiting professor in the Public Understanding of Science at Michigan State University, and a visiting global distinguished professor at NYU College of Arts and Sciences. Natalie Jeremijenko blends art, engineering, environmentalism, biochemistry, and more to create real-life experiments that enable social change. As director of the X-Design Environmental Health Clinic at NYU, she helps prescribe creative health solutions for the environment that are carried out by enthusiastic volunteers. Her individual work was, has been exhibited in the Mass MOCA, I believe it's still there, right? The tree. Uh, the Whitney Museum and the Cooper Hewitt Museum, and she's part of an artist collective called the Bureau of Inverse Technology. In our era where interdisciplinarity is a must and audiences' participation is a constant request in art and beyond, Natalie Jerebinjeko is a leading figure to inspire us to become, and here I borrow her term, think care, a combination of think makers and thinkers. Her unusual lab puts arts at work and addresses environmental woes by combining engineering know-how with public art and a team of volunteers. I see Natalie Jeremijenko's talk and residency as an open invitation to participate. Please accept this invitation. Please um, come to the reception afterwards. And also, please remain seated for the period of uh, questions and answers. Uh, please join me in welcoming Natalie Jeremijenko. <laughs> I eventually did give a um, title to Jerry, um, and that title was, um, Who Am I to Say? What Am I to Do? Um, okay. uh, Who Am I to Say was one of the last um, quotes from Einstein in, at Princeton. A few um, young, uh, enthusiastic physicists were saying to him, discussing various things. Um, at a time when Einstein was described as being um, a lonely old man, depressed, uh, he'd lost the war uh, of quantum. And, uh, and yet, I would argue with that, and there's many different ways to interpret him, but he turned to the um, the enthusiastic young students who had asked him, well, what would you advise young physicists to be working on, to do? And he said, who am I to say? If Einstein says that, <laughs> I mean, uh, who am I to say? <laughs> um, and I think that that idea of what science is, embodied by that humble statement that was really, I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you what to think. 
I, I'm struggling with my own, you know, figuring things out. And it's all yours to do with it what you, you want. So that's how I took that, that uh, um, idea. And Einstein's always felt like a friend of mine. So I've told um, uh, a couple of people here that I'm going to um, present uh, a little correction to Einstein's um, theory of general relativity, the E equals MC squared. Um, who am I to say? Uh, I will get through um, my presentations, but this has come out of uh, the last very confusing year or so, um, two years really, after a very confusing um, 10 years or so. Um, I've been at NYU for about 10 years, um, and I've uh, been trying to do the work I'm doing, which I would summarize as addressing the second question, what am I to do? And I call that the crisis of agency. I think in the face of so many important environmental and political challenges, we all ask ourselves, what am I to do? Little old me, what am I to do as an individual, as a student, as a faculty, as an institution, with my family, what am I to do? This crisis of agency, I think, is the most important question. Um, and that's why I set up the Environmental Health Clinic. So who am I to say is, uh, um, I, there's always been a little bit of tension around my, what I call myself, but I, um, I call my, whatever, an exposition, um, because I set up the Environmental Health Clinic. But recently I was appointed to be the Fairy Queen of Catalonia mm -hmm. and changed my name to Natalonia, which I'll come to as well. Um, but the first, um, uh, I've also, instigated a new museum, the Museum of Natural Futures. Um, and it's really this twisting, oh, let me do that again, um, twisting the definition of health um, from one that's internal and atomized and medicalized and pharmaceuticalized and individualized to one that's external, one that's in the air quality in this room, in the food systems we share and the mobility systems and the institutions. Uh, these external determinants of health uh, predominate. And strangely enough, um, the healthcare industry doesn't behave as if that's the case. Um, I set up the Environmental Health Clinic to treat environmental issues as health issues and health issues as environmental issues. And it works like a clinic. Oh, I wanted to get, um, these are my little teasers. The other um, big idea that I'm, I wanted to present to you today is um, why you and I are more jellyfish um, than you might think or might have thought, and why um, the jellyfish brain theory, which is, I think, at least as interesting as the um, uh, correction to the general theory of relativity. Um, does anybody here believe in fairies and um, queens and kings and things like that? It's, um, no, right? <laughs> oh, you do? Oh, good. <laughs> We've got some. Um, good. <laughs> I'm glad. Um, uh, I was shocked when I was in, uh, I opened an exhibition in, in Catalonia um, called After the End of the World, which is up there now, and three environmental health clinics there. And it was right in the, uh, at the beginning of the independence, um, what do we call it? Let's call it a war, for want of a better, um, the independence movement. Um, which I would argue is an interesting movement um, to explore our political agency because it's not really about, uh, it's not about a xenophobic uh, ethnic purity. It's actually about uh, some sort of local autonomy to be able to make your own decisions instead of exporting um, all of our capital and ideas and resources to remote bureaucracies, whether they uh, corporate hierarchies or the EU or in Madrid. It's something that I think we can all sympathize with, but um, how and if it's uh, unfolding is an interesting story. But at the beginning um, and several times thereafter, Spain brought out um, the king, which I, th I thought was hilarious. <laughs> I don't, kings don't really exist, right? <laughs> I mean, even Queenie Pooh in, in, a, in um, 
London, uh, Elizabeth, right? Um, you know, it's a, it's a, a conceit of the imagination. That's not the form of governance we currently have, right? It's queens and kings. And, but nonetheless, the king pulled, um, was pulled out to say that he um, thought Catalonians should just, just be quiet. And, and, uh, and that seemed no more absurd than me being appointed to be the fairy queen of Catalonia, which is how some of this started. So we'll come back to more of that. Um, uh, and then the other thing, so there are kings and queens around. They're, um, they're everywhere, as it turns out. This is um, the fairy queen of Catalonia. Um, uh, and we've got many things. But who believes in astronauts? Does anybody believe in astronauts? You see, <laughs> so did I until recently. Um, I went down to Houston after um, uh, I was here in Vermont. I was doing a beautiful uh, residency that introduced me to this area, Eden, I call it. You know, New Hampshire and Vermont, this obscenely green. I come from Australia. It's, it's, um, it's obscene how green and <laughs> deliciously lovely it is here. But um, I was there and I saw what you probably all saw, these billowing clouds of uh, the explosions at the Akima plant after the Houston floods. Do you remember this? They were posted everywhere because, of course, lots of clouds. And it was one of those moments where I just had to... I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I was hearing them say uh, there are organic peroxides that are just going to let them explode because of the you know, generators and the power's up. Because, you know. And what they were showing is these big black clouds of hydrocarbons. And visual evidence is like they were saying organic peroxides, which doubles, you know, they double as a explosive device or for um, foaming polyurethane or bicycle helmets or something, right? And then there was hydrocarbons, some sort of oil products on the tip. I, you know, it was one of those things I couldn't, I couldn't. <laughs> it just was very confusing. How could they say that when it was so blatantly wrong and showed the image illustrating how wrong they are when they... So I went down there to see what was really going on. And, uh, and that started a very interesting and important adventure for me that I'm still unraveling and I'm here to ask you all to um, help me understand. So I was actually the only person on the ground at the Arkema site trying to figure out what was coming out. There were some subcontractors for the EPA that were holding on to some handhelds, but they were interns and kids that, you know, very diligently sitting there under the fallout. There was first responders. I tried to talk to them about what was actually happening. You know, they were told it was organic peroxides, that's what they were. They're now all in court suing Akima because it wasn't, of course. Um, and it was a very confusing time. I, um, I, was, I took some photographs, I found this fluorescing material all over, um, and I got some friends of mine who have the only drone with a cryogenically um, cooled uh, sensor that can go down low enough to get the signature of the hydrocarbons. And they came over. Of course, that's in Houston, the highest refinery uh, concentration in the world. Um, and, uh, but they slapped a no-fly zone over the, the explosion site. Uh, and I said, I'll fly. And they said, no, you won't. You don't, you don't have the license. You can't fly. Um, they couldn't fly because, of course, their income depended on them not um, defying that. Um, and so um, I called Megan Smith, who's, I was the best man at her wedding. The, right up, uh, the uh, maid of honor was a man. I was, the, anyway. Um, <laughs> Megan Smith um, was the CTO of America under Obama. And she said, well, call the astronauts. They'll do it. They're a public agency, right? They'll fly the drone um, because there are women and children and the public are being rained down something that we don't know about. They'll do it. And so I asked oh, Mark Kelly, one of the twins in a twin study, um, uh, if he could do it. And he said no. He couldn't. He couldn't override the no-fly zone, even though people's health, the public, the first responders, all of us were standing around not knowing what was coming out and therefore not knowing what to do. Um, uh, so I stopped believing in astronauts. 
and I started believing in fairy queens. And, um, and I'm here today to say, Houston, we have a problem. Um, uh, one of the problems that we have, well, hang on, let me go back. Um, I uh, last, three weeks ago, I went to um, visit my daughter, who's at um, Princeton. Um, I admit, <laughs> Uh, my daughter is a sophomore in Princeton. I've been, I have a lot of colleagues there. I've been there many times. It was the first time I'd really gone there to spend some time as a parent. And I looked at the place in very new eyes. And I found a pollution problem that I believe is the um, worst mercury pollution in the history of the United States, in the heart of the Princeton campus. And um, and I was very disturbed by this and spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to protect my daughter, what to do. I then went back to NYU, where I'm you know, from, and I found a very similar but more widely distributed mercury pollution. I found out that I have actually been intoxicated by five heavy metals, including mercury. Um, and uh, then I came here, and um, I just went to the stump, because this is stump me, right? Uh, where, where's the stump? And uh, on the stump is evidence. Those little glistening spots, this is a dry day. Um, uh, mercury, elemental mercury. Um, who am I to say? Um, this is at the end of a very um, long and interesting decade of trying to sees the um, enthusiasm that students have for redesigning and reimagining our relationship to natural systems in such a way that it improves our shared environmental health. I call this the space race of the 21st century. Right? It's the most exciting, important, complex systems design challenge we face. How do we redesign our shared infrastructure so that we don't just reduce food miles or reduce energy use or reduce waste or reduce, you know, that kind of idea that we can do less harm. You know, we can do something. We can make it better. And I've, I, you know, I want to emphasize this because the number one issue of students coming into the universities in the last 15 years has been the environment. There's been, you know, wars and refugee crises and other things. But the environment is of concern to young people, naturally enough, because they want one when, um, <laughs> Uh, and, um, and I have this problem called the suicidal, I call the suicidal student problem. Um, and that's when, you know, every semester there's one or two or three or sometimes more students who come and they say, uh, you know, they have dreadlocks usually or pink hair or something. I, you know, I'm vegan, I ride my bike, I, I print on both sides of the paper, um, but wouldn't the best thing for me to do be to suicide? Because then I'll have a smaller carbon footprint, I'll eat even less, and I, you know, and you know, the first few times that stumped me. You know, uh, I didn't know that I was a suicide counselor, but I have become one. And it's a um, uh, this idea that's the logical extension of conventional environmentalism or conservationism, right? To do less, to leave no trace, to do not touch, right? No. We can do something, and we can make it good. So that's the thesis that I work on, and that I invite you all into the space race of the 21st century, with or without astronauts. And we will address these issues, um, and in such a way that I, I really... Um, uh, in treating my own intoxication, metals intoxication, I've of course figured out what in the event that you might be um, intoxicated with uh, metals, what we can do. I mean, of course, in treating my daughters, um, two of my daughters, uh, and figure out where it comes from and, and how it um, comes. I'm going to um, skip over that one. That was just to make you a bit dizzy, disorient you. Um, <laughs> But the, um, uh, I wanted to jump into, come on. Sometimes my, 
Um, when I first got to NYU, I thought, oh, great, you know, I've got a startup fund, I'm research faculty, I'm going to build an uh, urban space station. Um, so uh, I launched um, the urban space, or launched the effort to build a, the urban space station. Um, and for a decade, I was um, working hard on doing that. Um, but I couldn't get NYU to agree. Um, my things are going a little bit slowly. Um, but this is the urban space station as it was built in Germany because it's easier to build things in Germany than it is to build in your own <laughs> university. Um, if you're at NYU, maybe Dartmouth is different. Maybe it's different. <laughs> but um, uh, the idea of the urban space station is that it takes the um, CO2 enriched air from uh, an environment like this and it cycles it through a commercial greenhouse structure that is um, aerodynamically designed as a kind of inverted wing so it sits down. Um, and then it resupplies oxygen, uh, oxygenated rich air back into the, um, the environment, into the lived environment. So like a commercial greenhouse, it takes about, um, you, you cycle air about once every uh, minute. And in a, a code building like this, you cycle uh, air once every 20 minutes, right, um, to comply with code, which means you're flushing indoor air with outdoor air, which is interesting because indoor air has benzene and toluene and icky stuff, so you've got to flush it out. But outdoor air has ozone and particulates and mercury and manganese and other things too. So we spend all this energy, actually 60% of the carbon footprint in a city is typically to do with buildings, not to do with the mobility. And most of that is that flushing the air, which doesn't make sense. But there's a, another dominant paradigm, not only the do less paradigm, it's the displacement paradigm. Oh, we've got toxic sludge in the Hudson River. Let's pump it out and ship it to Pennsylvania <laughs> or to the nearest third world country. We have um, you know, air, um, contaminated air problems. Let's kind of push it out, displacing the problem somewhere else, right? That doesn't work. The urban space station was intended to illustrate that we can 20 times the volume because of the air ratio, we can um, uh, treat our issues in situ locally. Um, so various versions of it here. Um, I also launched a, a new space agency called the XCIA agent, uh, agency um, with this. And this is something that can be built um, relatively inexpensively by a motley crew of students and faculty to um, for uh, not very much money for much less than, for instance, um, running uh, the HVAC system, the same building, for a year. Um, okay, so uh, there's some of the development of it. I just wanted to show you this because this is one of the projects that I've proposed. This is the another place the Urban Space Station was proposed for, but um, what I want you to see is a, um, the Invitational Nest, which is a repurposed flagpole that has a uh, nest platform built on it to invite um, a bird of prey, a kestrel, or a bald eagle, or in this case in Germany, a golden eagle, to nest there. We don't know whether they will or not, but they, um, it's an Invitational Nest, and I take bets on whether and when they will uh, settle there so that we can have as a symbol of, you know, people like to put eagles on, on symbols, <laughs> um, on flags and things. So we could have a living eagle instead of a, uh, you know, an image of one. Um, so the problem I give you is why and how it was so difficult to get that built um, at, in, at NYU. And now we'll come back to some of the other projects that I'd like to show you. And it turns out that having, um, getting that age where you need glasses is actually an advantage. And we'll, <laughs> oh, that's a hard argument to make, but um, let me show you a couple of other really concrete projects that I've been doing, all of which are characterized by a sense of um, uh, can be done radically inexpensively and uh, uh, 
are done because the rationale is they improve human and environmental health. So the pharmacy, um, the charge of the pharmacy is to look at urban agriculture and see how we can um, viably develop uh, strategies that can be in integrated into the urban environment as opposed to um, rural agriculture. Uh, I'll come back to this. This has become, in fact, that's is the Cultivate One's Garden is the, um, after Voltaire's Candide, um, the most influential book. It was on the top three most influential books. But it's an interesting political paradigm, and certainly the, the campaign of the Fairy Queen of Catalonia is oriented around this. Um, the Environmental Health Clinic is really everything you will see and everything I propose and I'm inviting you to consider undertaking here during my residency. Um, what we... I just, I, I, I'll just present that the only metric and the best proxy for the common good is human and environmental health. When it comes to changing our shared environment, there's you know left wing, right wing, pro development, anti development, pro nuclear, and you know it's the polarizations are all very difficult to get through. But I haven't found anybody who's anti health yet, although some people say Trump is. But I, I no one's anti health. <laughs> it's um, so it's the the commons, if you will, um, and understanding how we can. Um, make it better is the important goal. So the culmination of my residency is to have a make it better space time in a place where we can um, significantly improve a local infrastructure. And I'll tell you some of my ideas about this. I'd also like to work on the waste systems, the waste energy system that I've designed implementing in, um, in Catalonia, in Barcelona, um, is a small, um, outdoor community kitchen called The Kitchen is Closed or The Ex-Kitchen where we bring our um, own waste, our own garbage and through pyrolytic conversion and anaerobic digestion we um, deal with that waste locally converting that into energy. In both cases they produce methane and um, syngas which can be used for cooking on so you can come by the kitchen and make your coffee. Um, and it runs a flywheel. In Catalonia, I figured it out that just um, 200 of these small outdoor like barbecue areas will produce more energy than the three nuclear power plants that are currently powering Barcelona. Again, built by a motley crew of neighbors, students, and myself. And in doing so, knowing how to maintain, improve, and of course take that system to friends in Puerto Rico or Cuba where energy systems need to be upgraded and rethought. Um, so I propose doing one of uh, these here. And if you do, um, one of the ways I've been doing it, there's, we have these very nice garbage bags. Um, so this is where you can take your own garbage. Instead of delegating your garbage to somebody else in the back door that you don't know what's happening to it, right? There's a whole range of new sports, which I'll show you some of. Um, and these prescriptions are available to, they're all done openly and um, undertaken only if someone here wants them to happen. So I've got a repertoire. I have 398 um, prescriptions I've developed for, to improve the environmental health of um, in Catalonia, in Barcelona, radically, significantly, and inexpensively. And similar number that we could apply here. But none of them will happen unless somebody here says, oh, I'd really like to see that, how that waste energy system works, or I'd really like to get rhinoceros beetle wrestling happening. I'd really like to. So any of these things, I just say, um, I'm saying this because I, um, I'm not here to impose anything. I'm here to say, here's some things that would be fun to do. I've worked, I've worked them out uh, a little bit. I've worked them out um, uh, to some extent, but you know, making them work locally requires local knowledge 
and somebody who is interested enough to make them work. Um, and the, the big project that I started um, coming here, uh, when Jerry first contacted me, I just started working on dams. And uh, Wilson, who was a Dartmouth student um, who transferred to NYU, um, was, I was talking to him about it because I've fallen in love with this area. And this interesting issue of, I think there's 6,800 dams in Connecticut that need removal. There's about 1,500 in, um, in Vermont that need removal. There's about 9,000 in New, New York State, uh, about six to 8,000 in Massachusetts. I don't know how many. But these, you know, these are the dams from the Industrial Revolution. Many of them are sitting there, haven't been used, um, doing terrible things to the water. And the poor little eels and alewife and the aquatic biodiversity, they're smashing their skulls against these. Uh, they're just sitting there doing nothing. And they're very hard to remove, not because it's hard to remove them, you can just, you know, breach them or bomb them, and then you uh, poison everything downstream for 30 years. So that's not ideal. Um, but if you test them for what's in them, then you have to uh, dig them up, all that, all that um, sediment, and put it in a landfill. And that costs over $4,000 a truckload, and many, many of those truckloads. No municipality can do that. And who wants to lose their lakefront property, uh, reservoir front property? Um, anyway, so it's an interesting problem, and there's some great people at Dartmouth that have been working on it. But um, the X Dam project is to, in fact, um, impound that sediment and uh, remove, uh, let the water re, um, reroute. To, um, so you can keep your, you have your cake and eat it too, keep your lakefront property and eat, eat it too, but that sediment is gold. In the White Mountains and in the Green Mountains, there's neodymium, which is the gold of the 21st century, and uh, probably a few other rare earth metals. And for the last 50, 200 years, however old they are, they've been mining for us, collecting that. And so we will go out, I hope, in the Make It Better Fair and remove a dam or two and, uh, and uh, take out some interesting new opportunities to um, use the sediment that's been the obstacle to removing these dams uh, as the opportunity for tremendous new technologies and ideas, including picohydro to drive um, waste, uh, to drive uh, the X cloud, which I'll come to as well. Um, so the X cloud. Uh, all, this is all, all um, since 2014, the emissions due to our Google Docs and Instagram and Facebook posts, our cloud data storage and internet services, have been larger than all the emissions um, of the airline industry combined. And that's been growing exponentially. It's the only industry um, in the US who's, that the energy demands are increasing. And again, it's based on a very strange logic. It's very confusing, right? Have you ever lost an email? No. Distributing information is very easy. Distributing energy is hard. So why do we put all that information in these big server farms that generate heat, then we have to cool them, then we plug them into whatever we can, nuclear power or coal-fired power plant? Why do we do that? When we could put the data where the energy is, on all these rural streams, right? And we can convert the rural streams into revenue streams and the farmers into server farmers and, and create and diversify the rural economy in a significant and important way to um, not leave it behind. Um, so that's another xCloud um, idea. Okay, um, I'm gonna skip over these guys. Now, one of the other big constraints in this very confusing decade of mine has been the institutional ones. And why, you know, I thought with a bit of good design and good science, if you could make it inexpensive, and uh, <laughs> then it would just change, right? I want to show you this little animation just to start uh, with the institutional analysis. And that, this is um, uh, animated from some work I did uh, more than a decade ago looking at how people use 
uh, in a white box in the museum space, how they use information, right? And because you're standing next to someone reading the curatorial text, you don't speak to them, right? The social convention is you don't speak to them. But then what happened is our institutions transformed with this new technology, right? We had uh, audio tours. And now you would go through the same institutional context, same information, essentially, and you wouldn't talk to anybody because you couldn't hear them, right? So you have no, um, first case you're spatially synchronized, but don't speak to them. In this case, you're temporally synchronized, but you don't speak to them. Um, and so I developed some speakers, and this is characteristic of all the technology that I like and design and promote. Um, they're called listen speakers. They were small, they weren't big, booming things that you, tri you triggered them deliberately. And so when you did that, um, because it's sound, it uh, pierces the hushed, reverent, quiet of the museum space. Because it's sound, you uh, are all temporally and spatially synchronized, right? You're all standing next to each other. And because it's sound, you're much more likely to say something back. And what you see happening around the same information in the same institutional context is many more local interpretations happening talking to each other, drawing on the information that we have and interpreting it together. And that is the powerful supercomputer that I like and design for and around, um, using new technology as an opportunity for change in, in this. And yet, the technologies don't teach us how to see. And the exhibition that I've started pulling together in, um, over the next building, where I hope you'll join us later, there's nothing there to see, nothing. There's only things to see with. And um, one of the things that has been very difficult to see is the ozone damage that we have here and, are, and in Catalonia. Um, so you can see here, and you, I invite you to look on leaves around here. Um, not with, well, actually, it's interesting when the new leaves, I mean, we're, we're getting some leaves now, but probably the um, leaves that have been on all season, uh, all year, those little specks are the ozone damage on this palm. Um, ozone is um, a terrible and horrible um, uh, uh, contaminant that um, behaves in ways that I, again, I've only just realized how wrong my education was in, telling, in teaching me how and what ozone was. So before I go on, um, the Dartmouth Promissory Perfume. Uh, I've been doing a series of perfumes. Um, the uh, Promissory per Perfume is the perfume that um, smells like what Dartmouth will smell like once we maximize the leaf area index and increase the air quality and deal with the contaminants. Um, so it's a kind of whiff of the future, a kind of sensual, desirous um, idea of what we could make this into. I'm mixing it up. Anybody interested in perfumery, um, I'd be happy to work with you on it. Um, oh, many others. OK, I, hang on. OK, so. I'll come back to the ozone story uh, in a minute, but I really want to emphasize this one. When I was, I, I did a lot of um, doctoral work. I did three and a half PhDs, and I'm not proud of it, but it, um, it means that I um, had spent a lot of time in this role as a, as a student, trying to you know, soak it up. Um, and one of the things, I did a lot of doctoral work in evolutionary theory and worked with some really wonderful people. And I didn't once hear this powerful idea that has also changed my entire orientation. The idea that uh, evolution, when we think of the biomass of the world, 98% um, is the conservative estimate, 98% of the biomass uh, constitu it's constituted by a, the subset of symbiotic organisms um, we call mutualists. That's a lot, right? 
Um, mutualists are the subset that in the presence of uh, their mutualistic species, reproduce more, live longer, are better off, right? Not um, just sharing a niche and not in competition for resources, not in competition, right? And I've heard a lot and evolution is taught very much along the idea of selective pressure around competition. Um, competition, competition, competition. Um, and I'd never heard, I'd never heard that for the first approximation, the whole world is a mutualistic system where we benefit from each other's presence. And I don't think our systems look like they, they're from, uh, they, they look like they're from outer space. They don't look like they're a mutualistic uh, system because they don't benefit everybody. And that's the thing about mutualistic contexts is that everybody benefits, right? This benefit benefit analysis. So that um, is another interesting frame that I wanted to um, put up that all the forests, all the flowers, all the pollinators, and us are mutualists. And how that translates into um, redesigning our relationship with natural systems, I think is pretty interesting. Um, so uh, ooze, zoo backwards and without cages, is um, how do we design urban environments for non-humans. The invitational nest was an example of that, led, of course, by the fact that many birds of prey have already inhabited you know, human structures, and um, we might learn from them. Um, the pharmacy project, the charge of which is to design food and food systems so it actually improves human and environmental health, benefits um, many. Uh, this is based on this uh, Tyvek, um, which is a, uh, you know from your FedEx envelope or your, you know, bands when you go to um, music events. Um, incredible tensile strength, but micropores, so it breathes. And that means we can hang it over any railing, parapet, double-hung window. Here it is cross-dressing the Victorian Albert Museum in London, um, where we um, create closed system agriculture and we produce leaf area index. Um, the thing about Tyvek is it's soft, right? It's not like a, plant, a planter. If, uh, you know, a box can fall and kill people if you put it up high. Um, the, it, it's very hard to tear, and, and if it does, it'll just sprinkle down some dirt. Um, I put polyacrylamide gel in there so it um, expands to 400 times its size, so we get kind of a, the wet dry cycle is damped. Um, and the Tyvek breeds, right? So all around the bag is the oxygenated rhizomic, not just the inch on the top in normal container plants. So these are very easy to put on, very inexpensive, and this is probably what got me forcibly evicted from NYU faculty housing. I don't know. <laughs> um, but putting flowers on and around is um, uh, one of the issues. Oh, now I just I spoiled that. What would we, okay, what would we um, do, what would we grow if we had um, an inexpensive closed system um, agri agricultural um, platform that could go on and in the barren urban environments? And I would suggest that we would grow things that maximize the leaf area index, right? Leaf area being the amount of leaves you have, the complex canopy structure. This is not about just having decorative, you know, tree pit every uh, rhythmically along the street. This is actually about really complex uh, canopy structure because leaf area index is the only technology we have, the only demonstrated technology for improving urban air quality. Urban air quality is the number one human health risk. Right? We distribute our food currently in such a way that it gives our kids asthma and degrades the cardiovascular health of each one of us. Right? We do a lot of stupid things, but we know we've got an inexpensive, easy to distribute technology to improve that um, air quality. Wouldn't we do it? Turns out to be harder than, <laughs> than you think. Um, well, than I thought anyway. But um, it's not hard to implement, it's not uh, hard to maintain, and it um, Tyvex is a tremendous material for its uh, printability and its tensile strength in addition to um, uh, its capacity to absorb um, metal ions and other pollutants in addition to augment the, um, the 
leaf area function. So if you think of leaves as, uh, as tongues filled with little stomata licking the air, um, the, um, the question is, you know, what do you grow? And, um, and I thought about this a lot because in New York City there's a, there's a lot of rooftop farms and rooftop farms are fine except, you know, the beam sistering costs about, you know, $100,000 to, to get beyond an inch and a half of engineered soil to put on there. So, um, and then what they do grow up there is leafy greens. Right, I was just talking about the <laughs> leaves licking out all the uh, particulates. Um, probably not what you'd want to grow. What would you grow in an urban environment um, where you're not actually undercutting the rural environment, the rural, rural agricultural industry, which is what in um, Brooklyn Grange in New York City they're doing so, you know, because because it's cool, it's rooftop, they're competing exactly with the struggling family farms just seven miles up the Hudson in Rockland County. We're selling out to fracking because they, you know, they are. So I think it's actually an interesting problem and um, not one about trying to recapitulate rural agricultural in, in an urban environment where you can't, by definition, anything horizontal is of value, right? Even the fire escapes, you can't put pot plants on there, right? So it, it has to be vertical. Um, and the interesting thing about flowers, which I was going to ask you what you would grow, but <laughs> I'll just tell you, flowers, they the, um, their color signals um, potent antioxidants. They're powerful, um, power, the, the most nutrient-dense foods we know of. And we don't know how to eat them, really, except to put them on a cupcake or sprinkle them on a salad. So that's the challenge to us, is how do we reintegrate flowers back into our urban, or into our diets in a way that's delightful. Um, and that, um, <clears throat> for instance, these black pansies, uh, what's important about designing a new system is that, you know, you're addressing the things you know about about the last one. So we've designed our food systems for shelf life and for trucking them around. Um, and so perishability um, is a big issue. With flowers, you can get these highly perishable, um, non-distributable goods there. Um, so those black pansies, the blackest flowers ever grown, um, potent um, nutrient value, antioxidants. Um, we have recipes to flash and fuse them into vodka to make the best black pansy vodka in the world and the only black pansy vodka in the world. Um, but exploiting the perishability, you know, that if you don't use them within 15 minutes, they'll lose those delicate volatiles and they won't be at all delicious. But this idea that we could actually really take um, existing um, urban structures and inflorescence them easily, quickly, um, is the invitation I ask you to consider because it's the urban air quality we need to address. It's the air that you and I are breathing and we need to do it in a way that makes sense, not just decoratively, that we, there's multiple beneficiaries. And who else likes flowers? Pollinators, right? There's a pollinator crisis, so we're simultaneously addressing pollinators. Um, but we can take uh, really barren urban um, structures and inflorescence them to everybody's benefit. Um, I'll just, uh, oh yes, and it's much more fun to um, garden, farm while repelling than it is to do it on your hands and knees. And I don't know what Dartmouth would think about that, but I'm sure there'd be many eager young climbers. <laughs> Um, here. But um, yeah, how do you eat flowers is the interesting question. So we've developed a whole lot of recipes. Um, and I'll just show you a few of them, including the X cola uh, uh, recipe, which is a um, uh, actually the, these manufactories are open. The labor is, uh, I've done these a number of times, they're very delightfully fun, but problematic because I set out all of the steps you know, in a, in a low-skill industrial kind of workforce way. You just, there's the bottles and New York City bottle water, and then here's where you bubble it, and here's where you put in the syrups and the flavors, and if you want to put in the sugar death, fine, you can do that. Um, you, do, you just walk along, and I do this in museums and galleries, and I, you know, for a low-skilled job, 
I can tell you that people who go to museums and galleries where I do this can't seem to get a label on right. They can't seem to get the, <laughs> the syrup in, and they it spill. It's just, it turns out that low-skilled assembly line work is not at all unskilled. <laughs> um, and um, the more educated you are, I think the, the worse you are at it. But, um, you know, so for instance, Love Cola um, has New England um, aster flowers in it. Um, the Iroquois use them as a powerful lump, love potion. Um, happy Cola, uh, High Cola. These, you know, the, these uh, medicinal plants have um, mind-altering um, <laughs> uh, capacities and, and, of course, people who don't drink alcohol are very interested in, in this. Um, but um, the, another example is the flower floss where we take, um, that's not sugar, that's isomalt, which is, uh, diabetics use it as a sugar alternative. It's a metamucil, um, if anyone's got a sluggish gut. That's what you use, but it's optically clearer and it, um, it spins out very nicely. We put a color changing LED in the middle, sprinkle it with um, beautiful edible flowers and bee pollen and create a carnivalesque and delightful new food where the, the cultivation and production of that food um, also, um, you know, it's a dietary fiber, so it fosters biodiversity in your lower gut in addition to using the flowers where you're fostering biodiversity in your local environment. So benefit, benefit analysis. Um, it's delicious. We could do it if anyone wants to start flossing. Oh, but the other thing is that this problem about, you know, making um, people assemble their own food and being, you know, that open transparency of here's, here's an exciting you know, opportunity to think about how we can redesign our foods. And, and so I uh, instead developed a musical theater company called Child Labor. And I get children, in fact, to um, assemble uh, in musical but efficient assembly lines and sing. Um, and then, of course, their loving community and their adoring parents will buy whatever they make, <laughs> no matter what it is. And, and, um, and they're introduced to the kind of real economics of or colonomics of, you know, that distributing flavored uh, water around is uh, very profitable if, uh, if you do it right. So, um, so many of the foods are a great opportunity for rethinking what, um, our relationship to natural systems. It's a very sensual and important um, media. Um, and so I'll introduce you a couple. The um, wet kisses, for instance. So this is the marshmallow for kissing a frog, formerly known as Prince. And it's um, marshmallow, um, which is uh, a plant for rediscovering the marsh in marshmallow. Um, wetlands are um, very critical um, ecosystems that we haven't really built our um, food systems around. And we could, um, to great advantage, Turkish pepper, um, cognac, uh, creme de violette. Um, but gelabidum and bilocian, um, Gelabidum is a ubiquitous soil bacteria that's associated with wetlands. And when it's found on the microbial community of the skin of uh, frogs and salamanders, um, it seems to be, um, it seems to protect them from the deadly chytrid fungus. And you probably don't need me to tell you that the um, species extinction crisis of amphibians is worse than the dinosaurs um, and that we've been witnessing. And what have we done? Nothing. I would argue we could um, bite into a white kiss um, and uh, a wet kiss, sorry, and uh, their gelabidum that's inside this um, uh, is your, your lips are inoculated with it. So you're equipped, sorry, you're equipped to kiss a frog and protect it from the deadly chytrid fungus. Okay. Anyway, so these are, um, this is actually the paper on how bioaugmentation of um, uh, Jalevitum will help salamanders and frogs. Uh, Murkish Delight lures, we'll get to them, I hope. Um, the um, many other ideas. This is the signs of life, which looks like the ag bags, and it is, but is deployed as a sign um, or an X sign or a sign of life, um, which is, I'm going to take these off so I don't do that anymore. Um, you can see that, you know, this could be any commercial sign. It could be Dunkin' Donuts, right? We could have um, in our 
little municipalities and cities and universities. Okay, put up any sign you like, but that sign must also contribute to the common good, right? And then we would have a new signage industry where living signs not only promote the interests of the business that they're uh, promoting, but also increase the leaf area index to, um, for the benefits, the health benefits we all um, develop the urban floriculture um, and support pollinators and uh, butterflies. And I think work better as signs because there's lovely little butterflies floating around and, and you're more li likely to look. So this is an idea of how we can do a mutualistic system where we're all benefiting from that, right? It's not just commercial interests, it's not just public interests, it's not just the interests of the pollinators, it's all of them combined into an interesting knot. Um, setting a place at the table for non-humans is something that also concretizes this kind of kinship that we have with them. So this is tables that I've been doing, X tables where uh, humans and non-humans are accommodated. But I want you to look at the uh, phenological clock. Um, this is a list of all the species that visit that local park in The Hague. In, um, and the um, icon in the middle is a January through December um, clock. Each arc is a species and when they bloom, bud, migrate, emerge, they, their color turns on um, and when they don't. So we get to see the kind of temporal um, dynamics of an ecosystem. This is in the Victorian Albert Museum where I, I had 85 of the species um, aside from humans that live in West London. Um, and you can see um, around January through December, around the outside is the rainfall. And you really, I think, get a, a, a sense that, um, you know, when phenology is our most mm, beautiful and sensitive um, indicator of climate destabilization, right? And so when the, the little, very flower, uh, very temperature sensitive perennial flowers come out three weeks later, the little uh, caterpillars and you know that depend on them might like get where are they right um, and then of course the baby birds are all time to come out when the caterpillars you know uh, peak and then they get screwed and then of course the um, seed rain which is the biggest manipulator of land use aside from human agriculture that gets screwed up without the birds so we have this rippling effect of an interconnected interdependent um, system of which, of course, we're part. And this um, representation helps to understand that, um, doing small versions of these watches and clocks. If anybody is interested in doing a phenological clock around this area, we have, um, that's actually one of the first exercises in the XCIA um, agent's um, handbook, the manual for automation, I'm sorry, it gets me, um, which is actually a sketchbook and lab book for um, many of these collective observations where you're sketching the emergence and the, um, uh, what you see and we can um, concatenate that into a good representation of the system. Not something I could do by myself, not something we could even do even if I could get those big NSF grants, um, but something we could collectively do because it's delightful and it's interesting and exciting to theorize, well, how do we get the bats back? Why haven't we seen them? Where have they gone? What could, um, and we have a plan on that. <laughs> Jerry and I are conspiring already on making some beach houses out of yellow beach, which um, protects, um, the bats from the white nose syndrome, which seems to have uh, vacuumed the little brown bats from this area. But we're gonna we're gonna respond. And so this is, I suppose, um, my um, it's not a plea; it's a kind of invitation, um, a kind of desperate invitation, I think, <laughs> um, um, that we have. Um, that none of us have, feel like we have the qualifications or the expertise or the resources or the time to address any of these kind of wobbly, complex problems. 
None of us feel that. I mean, you know, I've been working on this a long time. I've got um, too many PhDs, and I, you know, and I, I don't, I don't know how to do it. But all we have is our response ability, our ability to respond, and that's the most important, you know, asset to have. If you care, if this is interesting, go with it. You know, um, figure out what we can do. Uh, you know, and I'm here for the next couple of months to just talk about ideas um, and how we can best do them. So responsibility. Please remember um, that you have that. Um, and um, uh, we'll be doing workshops where we can explore and collectively uh, reinvent that. So uh, one of the other tables for displaying the, um, there's no tables, there's no furniture in the exhibition space, um, but if anyone wants to build one, um, these nice little double glass tape, uh, glass on the top, it's not a glass, it's a transparent on the top, and um, you know, a normal table um, on the bottom where you can slip your books under your, your um, XCIA agent's handbooks um, and show you know, once a week what you've drawn, what you've observed. Um, and the nice thing about this table, or the characteristic I've um, designed, is that it has a little camera and some cams. I call them camel cams because when they see, when the table sees somebody who's under four foot two, it'll kneel down. Like, have you ever seen a camel kneel? Anyway, it's very funny. And the table will um, impersonate the camel to present itself to the small people who also are interested in observing and understanding it. So this is your pages from your um, handbook. Um, and again, it's privileging the, yes, we can, uh, we can massify them into the information ages, big data uh, representation, but it's really about, uh, this is a table of contents really for your sketches. Because when you sketch something, your intimacy with it is so much, your knowledge of it is so different to when you take an Instagram image or anything else, right? So your handwork is what we're looking at. Um, uh, Cross-dressing bicycles, something else you might consider doing, um, where we take the non-humans that we would like to promote or events, make it better space times or um, other um, things, and we put them on bicycles in Tyvek. Um, so that um, on-street advertising, which is typically only it's too expensive or too regulated for anybody um, except for telephone companies um, to advertise or banks to advertise on, on the street. So in this way, we can uh, take the informal, independent um, mobility of uh, people. Bikes is the icon of independent mobility. and. Um, marry them with, you know, small, you know, music um, school for children or uh, experimental theatre group and, and you can advertise. So I do this, mis uh, this mismatching, match it. And, um, and in New York, these students get paid, you know, to park the bike where they would already park their bike. They get paid, um, you know, $100 for two months, right? You can pay off your bike very quickly with a few of those, and uh, the you know the uh, music school for children um, who could not afford to put a, you know four lines in Village Voice costs them four hundred dollars for you know half a week, right? They can't afford that, so it changes the who's in and about the economy. I hope we get to the muscle choir because I'd love to do a muscle choir here. Um, uh, the, Another bike project is um, uh, in and around um, persistence of visions displays uh, uh, with a group in Mexico City. We wrote this open source software. So now when on your bike you put on a persistence of vision display, which of course makes you more visible, but um, we combine that with geolocated information. So at Connecticut College, where we set it up, the um, the kid who was killed crossing the pedestrian walkway to school, every time the cyclists go through there, the, um, his artwork appears on, on the wheels and along the, the um, bike track on the 
um, along the water, the little seahorses who live there jump up on the wheels. You can see them. So this idea of making this durable but ephemeral um, displays that, of course, benefit the cyclist and, um, and I think all of us. Um, so that's another, again, it would only work if people wanted to make it happen and make it work and update and create interesting and important information. Um, the moth cinema. Um, okay, this one I'm going to do just because, <laughs> because I want to anyway. But, um, <laughs> but if um, it's easy enough to do, it's a um, silver screen or a facade that um, is illuminated by light. Um, and of course, those lights attract moths. And the moths you have around this area. They're like koalas and kangaroos. I mean, it's like, I've, they're, they're incredible. The lunar moths, they're all of these amazing things. Um, and moths are, of course, the biggest um, uh, pollinators, um, not, the, um, not those. But moths in general, uh, after bees, they're the most important pollinators, um, and particularly in an ecosystem like this. But in the case of the moth cinema, instead of just frying, you know, attracting those and um, uh, frying them. The moths that are attracted find a moth garden and they bounce around playing out their nightly dramas, casting dramatic shadows, their love triangles, their adventures. Um, and we, um, I've been composing and playing nocturnes and I invite other people who are composers to, to do um, some meditations on the night. So we really use it as a concert hall. That was the first lunar moth seen in New York City in over 40 years at the Moth Cinema. Um, I might have put some eggs there, but <laughs> nonetheless, <laughs> it, um, it was there. And, um, and we have, actually, there's a wonderful guy um, in Maine who um, breeds these moths. And uh, Wild Pets um, is uh, one of the uh, ex-clinic projects where you can have moths or cocoons or caterpillars where um, you get them with buying between five and 15 uh, host plants. And so that when your wild pet actually grows up and you send it off and it walks across and graduates, um, you have also uh, improved its uh, environment. And so you know, so anyone who wants to nurse and rear some wild pets that might populate the moths uh, cinema. Um, uh, we've got a whole range of wonderful moths available. So back to the, um, the concert hall, this idea that we um, play the, um, I use an ultrasonic transducer, and I play the music through, um, we, uh, so it's the first cross-species performance venue, really. So we play in cross-species stereo. That is, the same music you're hearing, the moths are hearing. And you can see, oh, do the moths like that? Oh, they seem to be getting into that, right? They, um, but um, it also does uh, an important function, which is to, um, uh, let, me just, let me show you the little ultrasonic speaker. You can see it down there, um, just glinting there. Um, when Moths have really great hearing, right? They co-evolved with bats. So they um, probably have better hearing, the best hearing of all organisms. They hear through their whole thora thoracic um, chamber. And um, by playing the ultrasonic, uh, we are, of course, blinding, not violently. We're, um, we're, putting a, uh, we're lifting predation pressure. The bats can't see them. It's no longer a kind of McDonald's to come in and get kind of disoriented um, uh, insects, it actually um, keeps the bats away. So this formula of creating intensified habitat and lifting predation pressure with our strategy organisms, organisms that lay 200, 2,000 eggs at a time, is the best news we have. In the marine ecosystems, it's the only thing that's in, uh, in and around Spain, they've used these no-take reserves within one season, 400% increases in the population, um, and um, they re repopulate all the surrounding areas with one, in one season. These are strategy organisms, not like us, K-strategy organisms. They 
can um, respond in weeks or months. And so just with one moth cinema, we can use that to repopulate and address the pollinator crisis, perhaps all through Dartmouth and the surrounding area. So, um, and then of course we um, uh, have this intimate um, relationship with the moths. And these are actually the portraits um, from that, that um, uh, English version of the, um, the Dr. X's. Um, so I formed these advisory committees um, that are populated by um, people who have expertise. What happens in, in our urban environments, and particularly university environments, is that we have no shortage of experts. But none of those experts are ever kind of invited to think about, well, how do we generate power on this university? And how could we do it better? And what does it mean? We're, we're all talking to our international communities you know, elsewhere, and we're not using our expertise locally. And so Doctors Without Disciplinary Borders, the Dr. X's, um, is um, I hand out honorary doctorates and to those who don't have them, who have expertise. And, and if you know some faculty member wants another honor, another doctorate, they can have them, right? But um, it's about forming a um, a radically cross-disciplinary um, community who are oriented towards improving human and environmental health. Right? Um, and so to do that in this um, period of of my residency, I'll be hosting what I call. Um, truth and reconciliation, reimagination, redesign, and recreation commissions, which are um, uh, truth truces for short, um, where we have a design jury of sorts, but um, it's the only way actually education gets done. In the creative, in visual and performing arts, and in architecture and design, they do this thing that kind of many scientists and humanities people don't understand. They, have, they don't actually have grades. They just have these juries where people come along and they all sit beside and they talk. And, you know, it's a, you know, sometimes it's uh, wonderful, sometimes it's cruel, sometimes it's, it's, but it's, this is the, the only, that's the thing that characterizes creative education, right? It's not in, in the other fields. And architects actually don't know how unusual their practice, this practice is of doing these crits, these juries, these, um, and yet they're valuable because I know a lot about architecture only because I do a lot of these juries and I don't read the books of my <laughs> um, architectural, um, you know, friends. Um, but I do know their arguments because you're presenting your arguments. You have this cross-disciplinary discussion around something very productive, which is a student's work. And it's an it's extraordinarily useful way to coordinate many different opinions around a kind of shuddering, <laughs> nervous student, but who learns tremendously from it. And I, I think, um, but I've interpreted that for our truth, truth, is, uh, our, our truth commissions in order to take on something like this problem. And I swear, I mean, I'm actually, I don't swear, I, I bet. I'm taking bets on all of these. Um, I would like you all to bet on whether or not you think you have any metal intoxications. Because if I've had it, two of my daughters have had it. This is new. It's pretty likely you've got some metal intoxications yourself. Um, what do we do? We sue, do we send out press releases? Ugh, horrible, ick. That's not gonna do anything, right? That's just gonna, what do we do? No one's gonna tell us what to do. We've got to figure that out. And I invite you to come to these truth commissions where, where it's oriented only on the productive, constructive, delightful response that we can have to a shared and terrible problem. I mean, the amount of mercury, if I'm right, who am I to say? If I'm right, these are what in the universities. Administrative decisions to go towards microgrids and have local generators that are pouring mercury and manganese and nickel and other 
things on the students. You know, terrible neurotoxicants, all of them. On the smartest people in the world. It's an interesting thing. Are we smart enough to respond, to demonstrate response ability? And I would hope so. So these truth commissions, we will act out the technical things. So students and other game folks will be required to act as nickel or as the cogen plant or as the stump on the hill, and um, you will characterize it. So it's not, it's not tech, it's a kind of uh, fun and delightful way to explore the technical uh, things that we're grappling with. Um, and we will all, I would hope, come up with um, interesting and exciting ways to make it better. So I hope to have four um, truth commissions during the residency. They'll be in the, um, in the exhibition space and we'll have all the materials and draw as many of the local experts. Uh, experts. And then there's a secret, apart from the Dr. X's, there's another secret advisory board, the motherboard. And you can imagine who's on the motherboard. Um, but uh, the um, other very simple ideas, these uh, uh, butterfly bridges, um, same material, lightweight, high strength, planting, um, butterfly attracting plants so we connect the, um, I see I can, I'm losing a few people but <laughs> I'm sorry for going on. I want to give you concrete examples. Um, uh, the biggest issue is these kind of, we've, we've actually fractured and um, uh, created patch ecologies, healthy ecologies that are all disconnected. And so we have these little islands of, of um, kind of stranded organisms. And by, by creating connections, um, we can, in fact, um, reinforce the uh, zebra crossings for zebras and for um, butterflies as they're attracted to the plants and they go from one healthy patch of urban habitat to another. Um, instead of being smeared on your windscreen, um, we can, in fact, use them again as, as a butterfly bridge and overpass to ensure safe crossing. Um, okay, uh, we were getting 30 butterflies an hour um, crossing. Salamander superhighway, similarly. Uh, in Vermont, uh, a year and a half ago, they built the first salamander crossing. It cost the um, Sierra Club and the Nature Conservancy $380,000. It's a big concrete culvert. And um, this horrified me because uh, the salamander superhighway I built cost um, $150. Um, and, um, and you can put them all everywhere because salamanders often change their mind about where they are going to cross the road. And as you know, around here, the crossings are important. So these are just a, a cast iron pipe from normal um, utilities um, that are drilled with the projection of the celestial um, so that it gets a nice dapple light. And because um, salamanders actually don't like to go in big dark um, concrete culverts or they like the um, light. And, um, and yeah, and there's a little RFID sensor in there so when the salamander goes through, it'll tweet, hi honey, I'm coming home. Or um, in this case, um, you know, important questions like what comes first, the salamander or the migration route, which was from the Socratic salamander <laughs> in Socrates Sculpture Park. Um, and so this idea of inexpensive ways uh, to gleefully create um, and address these problems um, and treat them not as speed bumps but as opportunities um, become um, really an interesting and important thing. Again, I'm, I'm going to keep going with a couple more um, concrete examples. Um, this is biochar. That's a byproduct of the pyrolytic conversion that um, of lignocellulosic waste. Uh, paper packaging and food waste are the two biggest waste streams on any campus. I haven't done it for Dartmouth yet, but I know just the paper waste alone at NYU would generate enough energy to run the entire data systems and all the lighting. Um, here um, is the byproduct of that waste energy system. We're generating energy, right? And then we produce biochar. Biochar, when you work it into the ground, I probably don't have to tell you uh, here. I mean, Dartmouth, right? Um, 
you know, it sequesters carbon for probably 2,000 years, who's counting at that point, right? This is not planting a tree 100 years. This is thousands of years. Um, and the civilizations that have used biochar that have built the soil in the Amazon, the, uh, Terra Preta, the healthiest soil in the world in Australia, Terra Preta Australis, healthiest soil in the world. It increases the, um, the, it creates, I think of it as creating luxury housing developments for soil microbes. And you know, it's just, it's inert, right? But it, it houses these diverse um, microbes that of course release many more nutrients to the soil, to the plants. And we get about a 40%, I, I got a 40% increase in, in growth. You can see where it was biochar enriched and where it wasn't. In addition, um, it's the only technology that I know of in combination with the anaerobic digest uh, from the food waste um, that in combination uh, will remediate lead, mercury, and ubiquitous terrible neurotoxicants that we have everywhere. So worth trying because um, putting lead and mercury into the brains of college students or children um, there's no city that has a systematic um, lead remediation project in the world that I have found. And we've been collecting in the US the lead levels in uh, children. Uh, it's, you know, you have to. Every child gets it in the first five years, they get their um, blood levels of lead done. We've got data up the wazoo. There's lead in everybody. Why don't we do something about it, right? So this is a way we can do it. And actually, there's some great faculty here who have, who know some of the wonderful microbes um, involved in the anaerobic digestion. Um, OK, I'm going to finish off. That's actually a public toilet for pigeons. Just um, uh, uh, here's an a, a interesting new sport um, to take on the strongest animal in the world. Um, I don't know if you know that ants have got to, had a big PR company working with them. It's not ants, it's actually rhinoceros beetles that um, have these biomechanically impossible capacity to lift up cellulose and aerate the, uh, the soil. Um, tremendous. The world is actually a beetle world. But the, um, the rhinoceros beetle is the strongest, so the rhinoceros beetle wrestling device, this new sport, allows you to climb in and it scales human forces to beetle scale and beetle forces to human scale. So it's a level playing field. And um, then you can take on the strongest beast in the world. Um, and I take bets, again, um, on how and if, um, who's going to win. I set the odds. And um, these guys don't like to be beaten. I can tell you that. <laughs> so um, you can imagine if we had a varsity sport where everybody, you know, I offer it a um, rhinoceros beetle uh, wrestling scholarship to my program at NYU. <laughs> but if all of us had this, then we'd have many more rhinoceros beetles around. And that toxic turf we call um, sports fields would actually potentially be transformed into um, habitat that um, uh, fosters much more diversity. And the strange thing that our sports, why do we design sports that degrade environmental health? When, you know? So exports are ones that are designed to improve human health and environmental health, right? So that they, it works both ways. Um, and there's training programs. We can design training programs for anyone who wants one here. For instance, the uh, hula hooping core condition um, is everyone knows how important that is best for um, for core conditioning um, core strength is hula hooping um, even boys can do it maybe <laughs> um, but the um, the thing is in, in our uh, hula hoops in the environmental health clinic um, we fill them with New England wildflower seeds and so every week you go out and you're spreading perennial resources for flowers and the birds and um, and next week you're more likely to go back because you want to see what's sprouted, what's come up. Right? Um, the tree office, surely there's a tree that needs an office. Um, these are offices and trees. That are, The conceit is, of course, that they're owned and operated by the tree. They're built in the trees for the tree's benefit. 
And um, they, uh, this is, that was in New York, this is in Berlin. These are um, named, uh, this is the, the kind of founding tree, if you will. It's not a stump, I know, but it's actually a tree. Um, that stump is very funny and very sad. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I work a lot with trees, but that stump, <laughs> I just, it's still, <laughs> it's weird, it's just weird. <laughs> the zombie stump, <laughs> I just, anyway, this tree, is the, um, the tree that owns itself in um, Athens, Georgia, um, which in 1832 uh, was willed to itself by William Jackson, the colonel who loved his tree. And unfortunately, it, and the eight foot by eight foot plot of land around it. Unfortunately, the, the tree died eventually, and so the Junior Ladies Gardening Club came along in 1946 and planted a ski on that tree back on the eight foot by eight foot plot and tested heritability laws and the tree that owns itself continues to own itself. So this idea that we can extend rights discourse from human rights to non-human rights um, makes a lot of sense. Um, I think there was 41 sovereign nations who went to COP21 to say we would like you know, these rights of Earth to be instantiated. They were, um, they were rejected, but nonetheless, you can um, develop your own tree office. This is the one in London where people um, you know, owned and operated by this tree, um, uh, Rupert. Um, built in his benefit, relieves the compaction around the tree, um, and as a delightful space to uh, enjoy and explore other systems. Uh, the roof, I'll point out, in places like London where it rains a lot, you really do need a roof. Although you don't want the, the structural shadow, right? So this is uh, an ETFE roof, which um, I put grey water in, and the people who sponsored this were so angry at me. But because if you, in engineering, if you combine um, pneumatics and hydraulics, it's like church and state. It's like I don't know. It's anyway. It, this is inflated um, pillows that I put grey water into, and then of course the grey water um, um, uh, evaporates, condenses on the top, and then comes down the side and collects. And so you have a water cooler for the office, right? A distributed local system that um, is slow and steady, and um, it's fun to work underwater and to um, explore what these new systems could look like instead of having the insane um, gazillions of dollars of concrete that um, puts water into water treatment facilities that get overwhelmed and don't work. And the centralized way of doing things we know doesn't work. It's one of the big challenges we face is to redesign our, this is the one in Boulder, Colorado, um, uh, delightful places to work and be, and really to explore what, you know, it just makes sense legally that why we have to have a river that is, um, finds people or farmers that have got their income sufficiently impacted that they can sue on behalf of getting the river doesn't make any sense, right? If a river is trashed by, anyway, the laws, the laws are a fiction that we can reinvent and remake and I invite you to join me in doing so. Um, and our trees are wonderful. I'm gonna skip to just the end of a couple of more ambitious projects. This one was in Singapore one where we could, with these waste energy systems that are outlined, just in Singapore we can hack the Hadley cell and um, change climate, that, the major cell that picks up with the performance of, of stomata working in collaboration with trees and other non-humans. Um, the muscle choir I'll show you is a, um, using these intelligent organisms, blue mussels, ubiquitous, um, international. Um, and what I do is um, put little Hall effect sensors onto the, the muscle so we know when it opens and closes. Um, and then the muscles um, don't really have a voice, right, in contemporary society. Um, so um, can I have yours? I take um, the voices of other people, charismatic people, Bette Midler, the, um, 
the mare, uh, and I give them to the mussels. Unlike in The Little Mermaid, you don't actually lose your voice, you, you're just giving your voice, and then the mussels sing. So the, uh, this is the mussel um, rock band, that's the touring band, and these um, singing away. Um, because of course, as they open and close, tells us a lot about water quality, their life depends on it. I trust the mussels more than the EPA, I'm sorry, I do. And it, it, you know, it's, and they're much more musical and fun. And just in looking at you know, a few places I've implemented and figured out how to do it in the Bosphorus in, in Istanbul, by putting the mussels on these mussel ropes along, orthogonal to the shore, you know, of course they're picking up the energy, which um, means that it's depositing out the um, particulates, so you're shoring up the shoreline. We put a bio-oscillator on those um, muscle ropes, um, and that you can, uh, generates energy, so you can charge your cell phone on it. Right? Um, it creates, uh, it can be put in and implemented and maintained by disenfranchised uh, immigrant women, um, and it provides food security. Um, and just by lining the public waterway without interfering with any of the shipping channels, we can generate enough energy to power all the lights in um, Istanbul. So the recoupling of systems, oh, and the really interesting thing about this is that the Black Sea, uh, where my family comes from, Ukraine, around there, was invaded by um, alien monsters, the Welks. Um, and um, the Black Sea, you know, all of civilization in Europe kind of empties into it. And it depended on all the muscles holding back all the nutrients that were coming out. And when the invasion of the alien whelks came in, they sat on top of the, the um, muscles and um, crawled along, got on top of them, drilled into them, and put in some toxins to turn them into um, you know, protein smoothies and suck them out. 98% uh, of the muscles species have disappeared in Black Sea with these Asian whelks. But what this does, because the mussels are, of course, not on the benthic surface anymore, the um, body snatching alien whelks can't get to them, and they're sitting up there going, na na na, na you, know, <laughs> you can't get me. And so we can repopulate um, the entire Black Sea with. Anyway, what are the uh, mussels sing? I will uh, skip over this because um, that's um, fun, but, but we'll. Um, do it another time. This is the, a, a buoy array that um, uh, similarly um, has a, it's a lightweight distributed infrastructure design that um, it's an always on light that is um, on the top, is a warm color when dissolved oxygen is low and a cool blue green color when dissolved oxygen is high. And on the bottom is a light that goes on whenever a fish swims underneath. And so then you can answer that fundamental question that, you know, are there fish in the East River? And yes, of course, there are fish in the East River. And not only can you see they're there um, as they go across, um, you can talk to them. Um, so you can text them, I'll come back to that. Um, this buoy, um, one of my, uh, my doctoral work at Stanford in precision engineering was on the Gravity Pro B and so I, worked on the design of the precision optics system for the satellite that was testing the warp of space-time and general relativity. Um, it didn't look like this, but this is um, a rope with a submerged buoy and helical anchors, which takes the same principle um, of uh, a perfectly constrained tripod, but in tension rather than in compression, and creates a fixed point. What they do in the marine uh, system and in naval architecture and everywhere. That's a um, usually forty to fifty thousand dollar concrete pylon, right? I have the same performance. Well, in fact, it's a hundred times stronger. It has no catastrophic failure um, mode. You can't, uh, and it um, uh, is radically inexpensive. Probably, you know, fifty thousand this a year about, you know, I can put it in myself again, very easy to put in. So the infrastructure is radically different, and yet, why doesn't this happen? I was actually the first appointed 
artists in residence in the Department of Design and Construction that's overseeing the, re, um, the redoing of, of the, the um, sort of post-Sandy uh, shoreline. And uh, the new appointee um, who had appointed and said, we'd love to have an artist in residence come in. And so um, he was an engineer. And I was so excited that there would be an engineer in public office that could oversee this, you know, redesigning. I lasted as the artist in residence for the Department of Design and Construction for a day. Because <laughs> I talked to him about these ideas, you know, as an engineer, just on technical issues. And herein you see the issue, right? He's a, it had a competition and, you know, what I call a $200,000 Photoshop competition. They'd had all these architecture <laughs> groups come together and, you know, and they big, these frat boys from Denmark won the competition and they're um, building these big concrete seawalls that won't last at all. It kind of, it's just immoral and horrifying that they could be doing such a vastly wrong design for, I think the budget, and you know, it's over 200 million, I, I don't know, it's huge amounts of money for stupid design that doesn't get openly debated or discussed. And of course he has to, that's his job, is to make it happen, right? Not to make it right. So many of our systems and uh, uh, that we trust and don't realize that there, of course, there's no, there's no opportunity to really radically innovate, to really do the kind of intellectual leadership that we think, you know, the Department of Design and Construction would be doing. Um, I'm going to finish here, but I just wanted to um, show you that this um, this is texting the, the um, fish and that they text, text you back and the ideas of it. Um, uh, but really kind of developing the relationship with the non-humans and the lures that you saw before have a chelating agent in them. So when the fish ingest it, so you can share food, um, uh, the fish ingested it. It binds the bioaccumulated heavy metals um, and PCBs and passes it out as a uh, salt, so it settles into the into the benthic um, mud and is effectively removed from bioavailability. Right. So this idea that you're treating the fish's health um, in addition to treating your health because we're in this together. Right. So um, all of these. Uh, episodes and many more foods. I want to get to this one just to finish. Um, the peer-to-peer -peer is uh, developed for, again, for New York and for um, Cuba, um, which is looking at those technologies that I showed you before, just combining them into a peer, um, where we have the tripods and the muscle ropes generating energy and the um, desalinating cell um, creating fresh energy. And this is in the Netherlands, um, where interestingly, although they're known to be the, the aquatic, um, you know, to be battling the water, they didn't have a single helical anchor in the whole uh, country. I had to get them from um, the US. And, um, and the, the contrast between, here's a pier that actually, you know, produces fresh water, you can charge your cell phone on it, with a boat you can charge it. Um, you can, uh, it cultivates mussels and improves water quality through the mussel uh, filtering. Um, and this idea that we can design infrastructure that not only reduces a neg negative effect, but in fact is a delightful way to kind of put a hand out to Cuba, right? Um, this shoreline across here um, in, as we renegotiate those relationships. Um, this is the kind of technology I would like to see us imagining and building and realizing, even though it's against and beyond what is imagined by our city agencies, even though this is the version of a um, game changing, instead of putting the that rigid um, boardwalk back on after Superstorm Sandy came and used it as a battering ram to, you know, run into people and, um, you know, because the storm surge just picked it up like any rigid surface by replacing it with this 
um, mesh that was a, a polycarbonate mesh. Um, you create a context where about 100% of the solar throughput goes on and so instead of killing everything underneath in the way we build boardwalks to, a, to get to these delicate ecosystems, it in fact fosters and displays it and so you can see the little skipper moths that are pollinating the dune grasses that are in fact rebuilding the beach. And um, it's delightful. Um, and of course, the next storm surge, the water will just go straight through. So these small material demonstrations, I would argue, are the way to enlist and engage many more people into this the radical differences that can really improve human and environmental health and couple them all together. Um, okay, I'm going to stop with the, this is our um, uh, ex-pilot training um, strap-on flight simulators to, um, in fact, um, ex train up for um, flying through uh, our wet landings um, where, in, for instance, in um, Toronto, you know, we had um, hundreds of people fly in light, um, fast, emissionless, um, uh, mobility um, across past City Hall through downtown Toronto to, um, to explore exactly that, to create a, a public memory of a possible future, of a future where we do have um, mobility, particularly goods um, that can, you know, uh, delightfully uh, explore and and uh, transcend our existing systems. Um, so finally, um, these ideas that, this is the autopilot license that you sign yourself. This idea, oh, grandmothers were the most enthusiastic flyers, I have to tell you, they, um, <laughs> they were great. This idea that we can then take our mobility, um, our upward mobility, and rethink it, these are the um, uh, elevated elevators, just an elevator pitch for them. They, um, they, the building stops, the elevator keeps going. That creates a thermal difference. You, put, you use the greenhouse effect against the greenhouse effect. So um, the, your then uh, natural ventilation, passive ventilation, because now we have smart um, vents. It's a, uh, a change where instead of having um, all of our buildings and the shaft effect, the oldest technology in architecture, be about stopping them in the event that are, um, you know, clogging them up so that in the event of a fire, it doesn't propagate through the shaft. In this case, we um, have them closed in the event of a fire, but the rest of the time they're open, pulling natural ventilation, creating a view because to, for the building to stop and the to be able to see across and around is uh, a beautiful ride. Um, and the, the um, additional free fall and the next gen elevators means that um, you're generating energy using the elevator with regenerative braking to generate energy for the building. So again, this is a radical, um, radically uh, beneficial, inexpensive way to take an existing shaft and upgrade it. Um, uh, and of course produces access to the roof where we can really start to use um, zip line based. A final case study, this is a, there's a, um, a black cat bakery here that has uh, hundreds of trucks um, taking artisanal airy bread all around New York City and Queens and, um, and just for the, less than the cost of, one of running, running one of those trucks for one year um, you can put up uh, these zip lines on access zip lines that um, uh, have higher throughput, higher capacity, and, um, and of course, no emissions. So these are all just ways to concretize the wonderful challenge we have of reimagining and redesigning our relationship to natural systems. And I think it's important to give examples because there aren't many out there. There really aren't. And there's, that's not inevitable. That's a choice we make. And whether this institution 
And my struggles with NYU um, hasn't made me hopeful. But you would presume that universities are the place where that kind of intellectual leadership, that kind of experimentation can happen, where we can take um, some of the ideas and expertise and mash it up into something wonderful and delightful, a desirable future, and not try and bring in or cloak the environmental issues under uh, energy star ratings on white goods and colorful trash receptacles and dull metallic filling. It, this is not an accounting problem. This is not about gold stars. This is about reimagining based on what we know and based on what we want. It's based on our desire. Um, and so our responsibility um, may be all we have. But I know as a fairy queen of Catalonia, <laughs> as the exposition, and as somebody here to do a residency with you all, that um, the potential is great. The um, need is urgent, and the opportunity is here. Thank you so much. <laughs>